Good morning. Thank you for attending this webinar on trade finance. We're so pleased to have you with us. I am your moderator, Jenny Alton, from the New York Small Business Development Center Central Office. This webinar is hosted by the International Trade Department of the New York Small Business Development Center. We have with us today an amazing lineup of presenters from partner organizations, including federal, state, and local export assistance service providers. We have Carmela Mamas representing the U.S. Commercial Service New York, Catherine Bamberger from Global New York, our own Dr. Mercedes Sanchez Moore. We have Andrea Ratte from TD Bank and the New York District Export Council, Abby Martinez from the Office of International Trade of the U.S. Small Business Administration, and Richard Foy from the Export Import Bank of the United States. So you know, we are recording today. We will share links to PDF copies of the slides and the recording in a follow-up email. Attendees are muted and will not be on camera today. Your chats will only be visible to me and our presenters. If you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to type them in the Q&A box as they come up. You can open Zoom's Q&A box from the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will have our experts addressing questions throughout the session today, and uh, we will, time permitting, have a Q&A session at the end. You're going to receive a lot of information today, so we highly recommend that you contact your local SBDC for no-cost, high-quality assistance in identifying what your particular next steps would be in regard to trade finance and working with the organizations represented today. Our local SBDCs work with Dr. Sanchez Moore, who is our international trade director in this process, which means that you have access to her expertise through your local SBDC. I will put information in the chat about contacting your local center in a few moments. And with that, I will now turn the time over to Carmela Mamas, Director of U.S. Commercial Service New York, U.S. Department of Commerce. Thank you so much, Jenny. And it's a real pleasure to be here um, and join this webinar organized by the Small Business Development Center. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce's International Administration, um, and my agency under that is the U.S. Commercial Service. We are the lead federal export promotion agency, and we work closely with all the organizations on today's webinar, including Global New York, Exum SBA, and SBDC. And um, yeah, as a matter of fact, we're co-located here in Low Manhattan with the regional office of the Export Import Bank and the SBA's trade finance manager as well. Um, our clients are typically export ready companies who have, for example, been successful in exporting, I mean, in selling and establishing themselves in the US market, and now they're ready to explore international markets. And our clients are typically companies who manufacture a product or service that's at least 51% content. Um, thank you. So um, with that, um, we're, we have a worldwide network. We're in over 100 US cities, including one in Harlem, Lower Manhattan, one on Long Island, two in New Jersey. Um, we have an office in Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, and, and White Plains. Um, so the, the, the goal of that is to be closer to the U.S. companies in order to assist them in exporting. Yes, and um, our international offices, we're in over 80 countries, and that is, we're based in the commercial section of the American embassies and consulates. We have a foreign service who are American officers and we hire locally engaged staff from that market who know the language and the culture, and we assign them by industries. And it's their job to be aware of who the importers, distributors, and agents are, and government officials that could help US companies to reach international customers to compete and win. Next slide, please. 
So um, we could categorize our services in four categories. We do export counseling to U.S. companies, and we also promote foreign companies to invest in the U.S. We also have an extensive amount of market intelligence, which includes country reports, as well as market reports by industry. All this information is readily available to U.S. companies on trade.gov. That's www.trad.gov. So it's really important as you're thinking about exporting to do your homework, do the market research, help identify which countries you would have the most export potential with. So our market research repository on trade.gov could very, be very helpful. Um, we also do local domestic and international trade events and seminars and participate in webinars such as this. Um, a large event we do in, in New York is um, World Trade Week NYC, for example. It's a great networking event to see all the different resources available as well and meet them in person. And then if you are a more advanced company and you need advocacy or commercial diplomacy support, we also do that. So like, for example, if you're bidding on a foreign government project, keep us in mind. Next slide, please. So really, that's my entire quick presentation. I'm just here as a service provider. As um, Jenny said, it's important, you know, to, to work closely with your small business development centers, make sure you're expert ready. Um, and yeah, we're happy to help you at some stage. Um, but thank you so much. I'm happy to, you know, stay on and help answer any questions. Good morning. My name is Katherine Bamberger and I'm in the Albany um, Economic Development Office for Empire State Development. We are the agency that is involved in small business development, minority and women-owned businesses, economic incentives, and of course, international trade. For over 400 years, New York has been central at the, uh, the global trade um, activities. And so we're very pleased to be able to be here this morning. And thank you again to the SBDC for pulling this group together of incredible expertise that will be available to you at your fingertips. We have offices, as you can see, um, all over the world as well. Currently, these offices will offer you at no charge a market survey so that you can understand the dynamics politically and economically, as well as culturally, that affect business activities in each of those countries. Some of the markets are single, like Mexico and Canada. Some of them are multi-countries, such as Europe, Caribbean, and Africa. All of these folks will also provide, as part of their services, a list of potential trade partners that you might work with depending on your ideal customer, whether it be a distributor, an importer, a partner, a consolidator, et cetera. And again, currently these services are offered at no charge. Where we don't have representation, we do often work with the US Commercial Service and also the Foreign Agricultural Service from the USDA and where they have to charge fees for some of those services, those fees can be reimbursable through one of our grant programs. Next slide. We do have three key programs, the Export Marketing, Marketing Assistance Service, which is fondly known as EMAS because we're the government and we are all about our acronyms. Um, that service is again provided free of charge and the Global New York Grant Fund and the state trade expansion program known as STEP are funding opportunities. So on the first hand, you get information so that you know where your best target markets are, what kind of activities you need to undertake, what are some of the industry specific activities that are in that country for your business sector. And then the two grant programs can help fund opportunities to do exhibits, to build out your website, to translate your materials, into foreign languages, to pay for premiums on um, Exim Bank services, and also any fees associated with industry association, uh, foreign activities, trade missions, and US commercial service services. Thank you, the next slide. 
So these are the kinds of things, in addition to what I mentioned, financial service awards for travel is a follow-up to something like the Gold Key or the EMAS services so that once you identify potential partners, you can actually travel into the market and interview them and decide if it's a good match, inspect their facilities, et cetera. Um, any export training workshops are also eligible. As I mentioned, website foreign translation, consultancy services, for example, to do compliance manuals or export marketing um, plans, business marketing plans for the international audience are all eligible for reimbursement. Currently, they're reimbursed up to 60% and up to those amounts that are listed. The next. Some of the other activities that we have coming up, we have a partnership with the U.S. Commercial Service, Trade Winds Europe, where you can meet U.S. commercial officers from around the region um, in Turkey, as well as Italy and Romania. We are also taking a group to Arab Health in Dubai, but that activity is actually closed. That's happening next week. And then a second activity in the healthcare sector into Africa will be taking place this fall. I will be actually leading the trade mission to the Caribbean, which will actually be taking place in the beginning of 2025. And we will be offering that opportunity to companies to apply for that. And then we'll select those that have the best market opportunity. The next slide. My colleagues and I are located in New York City, as well as in regions around the state. Um, in particular, my regions are the North Country, Mohawk Valley, and Capital District. We have representatives in Buffalo and Rochester that also covers Syracuse and the central New York area, and in the Newburgh area where we cover both the Mid-Hudson Valley and the Southern Tier region. And we have several staff members who are in our uh, Midtown Manhattan office, um, not too far from the Exum and U.S. Commercial Service folks. So you have a, a variety of ways to interact with all of these programs and services. We all work very closely together and we're always happy to um, make referrals for different programs and services amongst each of the organizations. So thank you very much. Um, certainly feel free to reach out to me and you will be provided these contact information. Also, our website has all of this contact information and program information as well. And we welcome you to take a look there or reach out to any one of us. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you for attending this webinar. I am Dr. Mercedes Sanchez Moore, Director of International Trade of the New York Small Business Development Center. The New York SBDC is a partnership of the U.S. Small Business Administration, SUNY, the City University of New York, New York State, higher education institutions, and the private sector. The SBDC provides one-to-one -one business advisement, training, and research in support of entrepreneurship and economic development for the state of New York. The International Trade Initiative is a special program within the New York SBDC network, which is housed and part of the SUNY network of 20 regional centers and 72 outreach and satellite offices. 98% of the population in the state of New York is within 30 minutes of an SBDC service location. The New York SBDC International Trade Initiative supports SBDC clients statewide with expertise and experience on international trade and trade compliance. We also provide SBDC staff with professional development, increasing trade advising capabilities statewide. All of our services are free, customized, and 100% confidential. We help small and medium-sized companies become globally competitive by providing export development and import operations assistance throughout one-to-one -one consulting, market research, innovative training, and links to additional export resources provided by our partners that you have seen here, Global New York, the U.S. Commercial Service of the Department of Commerce, the Small Business Administration, Exim Bank, and other private and public organizations. The New York SBDC can help you your business become a successful competitor in foreign markets by helping you plan and implement your export strategy. Our international business consultants are available to assist retailers, manufacturers, high technology, and even service companies with export planning and other areas such as export readiness reviews, export business plans, targeting international markets, selecting sales and distribution channels, 
legal considerations and licensing, logistic procedures and documentation, market research and trade statistics, and international financing options. It is easier than ever to get into the marketplace, in the global marketplace. Many companies believe that the U.S. domestic market is big enough for meeting the revenue goals, but the fact is that 95% of the world buying power resides outside the U.S. Forward-thinking small and medium-sized businesses come tap into this buying power and grow their revenues through exporting. Each year, U.S. companies export well over $2 trillion of goods and services, exporting works for companies of all sizes. 97% of exporters are small and medium-sized enterprises, and 67% of exporters have fewer than 20 employees. If you are successfully operating a business in the United States, you owe to yourself to consider exporting. Many small businesses have products and services with international market appeal, but are not certain on how to proceed. The New York SBDC is here to help. We invite you to contact one of our 20 centers and schedule a no-cost action with the New York SBDC Certified Global Business Professional and realize your export potential today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Andrea Ratai. Andrea has over 30 years of experience in trade finance, structuring risk management and working capital solutions for importers and exporters of all sizes. She's passionate about international trade as a strategy for US companies to manage costs, diversify their sales, and showcase US made goods in the global marketplace. In her current position as head of global trade finance at TD Bank, Andrea has the privilege of meeting companies across the TD Bank footprint in a variety of industries. Andrea is chair of the New York District Export Council and served on the 2020-2022 U.S. Department of Commerce Trade Finance Advisory Council cohort. Prior to banking, Andrea worked at the U.S. Department of Commerce offices in Washington, D.C. and in New York City. Andrea earned her undergraduate degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and an MBA from NYU Stern School of Business. She lives in Long Island, where she and her husband raised their two children, now grown and flown. In her free time, Andrea enjoys cycling and traveling. Please, Andrea, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you so much, Mercedes, um, for that nice introduction and and thank you also to the SBDC for organizing this event today to share information and really also for including the New York District Export Council. That's really the hat that I'm wearing today. I chair the New York District Export Council as Mercedes as Dr. Moore mentioned. Um, we are a volunteer group of international trade professionals that includes representatives from across the international trade ecosystem. Uh, when you have as many players as you do to uh, effect a transaction across borders, that becomes an ecosystem. Uh, so we have people on the New York District Export Council ranging from logistics providers, uh, IP attorneys, uh, compliance consultants, so really runs the gamut. and. We're here as part of the outreach, the export outreach that is done under the auspices of the U.S. Commercial Service. Um, in, in New York, we work closely with Carmela Mamas and her team, as well as the other providers that you're hearing from today. And uh, the New York District Export Council is one of 60 district export councils across the United States because there's at least one in every state. And yes, I said 60, not 50, because big states like California and Texas, they they have a couple of uh, district export councils. So I just mentioned that because we are also a resource for outreach after this call or through, uh, through the U.S. Commercial Service, through Carmela and her team, and the others on the call as well. So with that, my day job as a banker uh, brings me to today's topic. Um, oh, okay. Just trying to, there we go. So today's agenda is um, 
pretty direct. We are going to talk about financing the trade cycle and include some of the ways that an exporter can work to mitigate the risk and also develop some le or leverage their working capital. So the, the first uh, shot here, the first slide is just a quick visual of what happens when a domestic company starts shipping overseas. There is an impact on the trade cycle and we can talk numbers. We've made some assumptions here about transit time when you're selling overseas. And so I guess, you know, we could talk about, we could talk about Canada, but that might, the shipment uh, time, the transit time won't be as impacted as um, goods that might have to go on a, on a vessel somewhere. Uh, so we're just going to assume this is for uh, ocean shipments from the U.S. to other countries. And we figure that that adds about 25 to 30 days to the transit time. Um, and I'm sure I'm, I don't have to explain to anybody how that might be, that might put a squeeze on a company's working capital, or we also call it a cash conversion cycle. Uh, the time from which you've input or invested in the product to sell to the time that you actually get paid. So this is kind of the foundation of what we'll be talking about today. And I'll probably spend about 30 minutes going through this series of slides. So this um, slide is, is really a visual that it, it, there's a lot of information packed in here, even though it, it looks pretty simple. But I'm going to draw your attention to the right side of this slide, where at the top you see exporter and importer. And an exporter is the same as a seller. The importer is the same as a buyer. So just like when you sell something on Craigslist or Facebook market, there's always this transfer of goods for payment that you kind of have to match. And in the case of international trade, uh, the range of payment terms run from open account at the top to advance payment at the bottom. Now, I'm going to start at the bottom with advance payment. This is sometimes a payment term that an exporter will start with for a new customer, some a, a party overseas that they don't have experience with. Or a party overseas who is um, buying a custom made piece of equipment, let's just say, or some other product. A lot of times with custom work like that, we see a deposit or an advance payment. Uh, so think about in your, in your own life, if you're ordering uh, from a caterer, you might have to put a deposit down because they're preparing food for you. Uh, that may be custom to what your needs are. So advanced payment is sometimes where an ex exporter might start. That is the least secure payment method for the buyer, the importer, because now they have wired you a deposit anywhere from, let's say, 10 to 20 percent, and now they have to wait for you to ship. It's not always a com comfortable place for, for the buyer. If we go back to the top of this ladder, the least secure method of, of payment or payment term for the exporter is open account. And that's because the exporter is shipping before they get paid. And the, and the payment will follow once they've invoiced the buyer. So that's also not so comfortable for the exporter. On the left here, um, there's outlined under payment methods with open account what the risks are. There is the risk of non-payment, as I just mentioned, and then also potentially an impact on your cash flow if you think back to that trade cycle slide uh, because of the transit time. If you're shipping, um, if you're if the if you're on an ocean, but your goods are on an ocean-going vessel, with the advance payment again going back down, as I mentioned before, the risks are that maybe the buyer doesn't receive the goods for some reason. And there's also a cash flow impact there. So working with banks who are engaged in trade finance, we kind of move to the center of this ladder using 
the payment mechanisms that are listed here, the collections and letters of credit, and we're going to go into that in a little more detail. So um, I'll just touch on this very quickly because really we're focusing on exports today. But, you know, if you look at import solutions, it's really just what is happening on the buyer side of your transaction. So it is useful to know or appreciate what their concerns may be. Um, with commercial letters of credit are a great import solution and export solution for the reasons listed here, because basically a bank is replacing the buyer's risk and agreeing to pay the seller in, in a nutshell. There are some caveats there that you that it's important everybody understands every exporter, and we'll talk a little bit about those too. Uh, I'd like to mention here that letters of credit can be issued in a foreign currency. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about foreign currency as well, Keep in mind that, you know, a lot of times I, I meet exporters who say, or importers who say, I, I, I don't have any foreign exchange risk with this transaction because I'm paying in dollars or I'm receiving in dollars. Really what that means is somewhere in the transaction, somebody had to exchange their home currency for, in this case, the US dollars. So there is foreign currency risk and that may be reflected in, in the ultimate pricing uh, that that you give or you get. We'll also touch on import collections and standby letters of credit, really helpful also for exporters and importers. So export solutions, the flip side of your buyer is what you all are gonna be focusing on as exporters. We talked, I talked a bit about payment risk if you are shipping on open account. So you want to look at how to ensure that you will be paid once you've shipped or before you shipped, depending on the situation. Uh, export documentary collections are a non-credit vehicle, as it says here. What that means is that uh, you don't need a bank line of credit or credit facility to participate in documentary collections. And that's really because the banks are acting as agents or intermediaries. Uh, we're passing along the, uh, the transit associated, um, the transport associated documents and invoice. And in exchange for that, it is expected then, or, or the instructions are to the buyer's bank that they have to make payment. Um, Export, uh, documentary collections are governed by a set of rules called URC 600. And I mention this because when we talk about international trade, in as much as you may think the banks are, you know, they're all in different countries, maybe they follow different rules. Actually, any bank that knows international trade, well, any bank that engages in international trade is obliged to follow the rules outlined by URC 600 in the case of documentary collection. Similarly, moving to export letters of credit, uh, their export letters of credit or import letters of credit in general are governed by rules UCP 600 that are updated about every 10 or 15 years. Not a lot of changes with trade, and it's administered by the International Chamber of Commerce. So again, we have a global standard that banks have to follow if they are processing or engaging in export letter of credit transaction. We'll touch on uh, confirmation of a letter of credit, which is a great way to further mitigate payment risk. Uh, discounting of time drafts serves to support working capital needs uh, standby letters of credit can be used for open account situations where you just want to know that you can go to uh, recoup your payment if the buyer doesn't pay you. Working capital financing, I'll touch on very briefly. Uh, that'll be a topic that Richard Foy will also cover, um, and he's the expert on that. And then standby letters of credit or bank guarantees for those various purposes listed. So risk management, that's what commercial letters of credit are all about. 
There, there are some key words on this slide. I'm not going to read it, read the slide, but I will highlight uh, some of the main takeaways. One is that letters of credit are an irrevocable undertaking by a bank. Irrevocable means you cannot take it away. You cannot take it away unilaterally. The only way that you can get out of the letter of credit is if the beneficiary or in this case, since we're talking about exports, the exporter agrees that they don't need the letter of credit anymore. So you have control. Once you get that letter of credit in your favor, you have control. Um, usually the letter of credit, the, the requirement for a letter of credit is written into your sales contract or maybe a pro forma invoice, uh, but it is something that is talked about at the beginning of your negotiation or as part of your negotiation and not after the fact. This is really important. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But basically, when you as an exporter receive a letter of credit in your favor covering a shipment that you are going to make, you need to make sure that you can meet every one of the terms and conditions in that letter of credit. This is super important because this is your ticket to payment. And if, for instance, you miss a shipment date, then you have not complied with the terms and conditions of the letter of credit. So that's also, that's why one of the reasons why with export letters of credit, it's not an after the fact mechanism. It is very much part of your upfront negotiation. The benefits of the letter of credit, the commercial letter of credit, are the buyer or importer gets an assurance of performance that the exporter will ship and they'll ship what they're supposed to ship and it will be evidenced by documents. More importantly, for you all on this, on this call, the exporter gets a financial assurance from the issuing bank. That means that if you ship per the terms and conditions of the LC, then you will get paid even if the buyer, for some reason, cannot pay you. And the reference to a SWIFT network is just the SWIFT network is, is the method of, uh, it's a secure closed system for, for communication that banks around the world use. So again, hopefully you're also seeing that there are these, um, these global standards that the bank, banks have to use and comply with. Um, Sorry, not advanced. There we go. A quick snapshot. This is what it looks like. The four box classic method. Um, and the the main thing here I'll ask you to, to take away is that the risk of the buyer is transferred to the letter of credit issuing bank when that bank agrees to take on the buyer's risk and issue that irrevocable undertaking. We won't go through all this, but there the boxes are numbered. And if you follow the flow, that's pretty standard for um, letters of credit. A transferable letter of credit is worth mentioning because for those of you who may be starting out, you know, you may have a really good contact overseas who is um, uh, very interested in your product. Maybe you're sourcing the product from somewhere else or from a different company, and that company, your supplier, is asking you for a letter of credit. And maybe you're a bit new to the business, and so you don't have a credit facility in place. If you ask your, if you require a letter of credit from your buyer, there is a method by which you could transfer the rights to that letter of credit to your supplier. And this, we, it, it's, it's a little more complex than a direct letter of credit to yourself, where then you are just the shipper and you're presenting documents. But it is worth considering for those situations where uh, you don't have necessarily the credit facility to issue a letter of credit. Uh, the benefit, I'll just highlight that, is, as I just mentioned, the middleman uh, in between the supplier and the buyer avoids issuing an LC uh, for themselves, and you can leverage the LC that your buyer issues. 
LC confirmation, just very quickly, we'll go to the bottom here, basically uh, the Y request confirmation. Actually, I'm gonna go here. Um, so sometimes a buyer, you know, has decided to open a letter of credit, but maybe you as the exporter are, are not comfortable with the issuing bank, or it's just not familiar to you, or you're newer to exporting and you really want to tighten this up in terms of risk management. Some companies might have a credit policy, some exporters, that requires or does not allow them to take foreign bank risk. And so for that reason, they might ask their bank in the U.S. to confirm the letter of credit. And without going into all of the details on that, uh, the basically your bank in the U.S. would agree that they will confirm the letter of credit such that if the issuing bank does not pay and you as the exporter, have complied with the letter of credit, then the confirming bank will pay you. So it's, it's again, just another way to manage your risk, depending what your tolerance is for risk or where the relationship with the buyer stands. And this is something to think about, depending also how early in the relationship are you with your buyer, as well as what country are they in. There might be some restrictions on foreign currency, other things that you're not so comfortable with, uh, maybe the legal system. Um, so you just want to make sure you you kind of tie that up. And again, this is something you want to include in your sales contract negotiations. Uh, finally, on letters of credit, is the standby LC. Um, this is something, it's a secondary payment vehicle, meaning you don't it, uh, unlike a commercial LC where you ship your goods and then you present your documents for payment, in this case, the standby LC is literally standing by. It's just there, almost like insurance. It's just there in the event your buyer doesn't pay their invoice. And so you, it's a simpler way of presenting documents and for certain types of transactions, it may make more sense. For instance, if you're making, <clears throat> excuse me, shipping a couple times a month to the same buyer and you don't want to have to present documents for payment every single time, you might agree with your buyer that they put a standby LC in place for an amount that will cover one or two shipments that may be outstanding at any time. And then as long as they're paying their invoices, you're not going to draw under this standby letter of credit, but it gives you the peace of mind. And that's the four box. This is really, I'll just draw your attention to this example where um, at the top there, if the goods, uh, for instance, if there was an advanced payment ship, uh, situation, the buyer has, has made the deposit and the exporter doesn't ship, uh, then the buyer can draw under the standby to get the advance payment back. That's just one example. Finally, on the letters of credit, uh, there are currency considerations. As I mentioned before, uh, somebody in the transaction is going to be holding the currency risk. For importers, it's going to impact their cost, uh, the, the foreign exchange component, and for exporters, it's going to impact the sales price or your profit or your your profit. Uh, so there are letters of credit can be issued in the foreign currency. So your buyer would speak to their bank about doing that, um, and they can either hedge that exposure or they can uh, just work through the spot market. Um, and the main thing is that either the buyer or the seller bears that currency conversion risk. And sometimes what we you might see is if if you wanted to be if you're willing to take the foreign currency payment, you could ask you uh, you could offer to quote both in US dollars as well as the foreign currency if you're willing to do that. And then the buyer can decide which one works for them.
that's just a sort of a practice that we've seen here and there over the years. I, I will say, I think probably 85 to 90 percent of U.S. trade is is probably in dollars. Uh, we we have the luxury of being a dominant currency around the world and a, a reserve currency. So uh, it, it does give us the advantage sometimes. But if your buyer overseas is working in a currency that is uh, suffering and it makes it more expensive for them to buy in U.S. dollars, that's when the foreign currency consideration can also come in. Documentary collections, uh, it, the only thing I'll say about this, the four boxes look very similar. The difference is there's a few less lines here because the collection is only initiated by the seller after they have shipped. A letter of credit is initiated by the buyer and that is put in place before the shipment. So that's why you, you saw the additional set of lines in those uh, graphics. So this is a bit uh, more straightforward. There is no bank undertaking. There is no irrevocable commitment by the buyer's bank to pay. So this is a good mechanism to use if you're working with a buyer whom you know well, uh, you have experience with them, or maybe you're selling off-the-shelf products. So um, you're, and you have multiple buyers in that country. So you're not so worried about goods getting there and not being paid, although you should always worry about being paid, of course. Uh, and the bank still, the bank's role there is really to control the conveyance of title, meaning like the bill of lading for your ocean shipment or your airway bill, um, although that's not a negotiable document. Um, but in any case, uh, it, it's a, a bit more straightforward and again, it's very appropriate for um, relationships where buyer and seller know each other. There are also countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan where it is required that there be collections or letters of credit uh, for any imports to those countries because they are, it, it's a way for the central bank and the banks to manage the reserve, the reserves that they have, the foreign currency reserves. So, you may see that in some parts of the world as you travel. And this is just a list that, you know, feel free to go through at your leisure because I think these slides will be shared, but these are some of the advantages and disadvantages. Documents against payment means that the buyer has to pay in order to receive the document. Documents against acceptance, oh, that's a mistake there, sorry. This should say payment, uh, acceptance on the DA. Um, in the acceptance portion, uh, and I'll make sure this is corrected before before we send these around, but in the acceptance, it's that the buyer, you, the seller is giving the buyer 30, 60 days from, from when the goods arrive, let's say, to make the payment. It's almost like open an account. And so this is also listing the advantages and disadvantages. Sorry about that typo. So going back to financing the working capital cycle, this is just a list of the financing options that are appropriate in either case and, and in at different stages of, um, of really of an exporter's life or transaction cycle. These just summarize the benefits for uh, buyer and seller in these cases. Um, Exim Bank, I'm, all I'm going to say about this is uh, it's a great program, the work, Export Working Capital, uh, as well as insurance. And Richard Foy is going to speak more about that. Uh, the only thing I'll say on that on this is that um, Exim Bank offers this product through a network of delegated authority lenders. Uh, there are 50 50 banks in the U.S., I think, at last count but uh, Richard knows better, who uh, participate in this delegated authority program. And it, it helps in terms of speeding up timing and expertise with the program. 
Uh, so that's something that you might speak to your bank about. And SBA offers a similar program for export working capital. These are really great ways to leverage your working capital availability when you're starting out as an exporter. Um, so finally, I'll close by just talking through what to look for in your international bank. It's, it is important, uh, it, it's more and more difficult these days because of KYC, know your customer requirements and compliance and such. It's more challenging today for a company to go to a bank and say, I have all of my business with my small local bank who I love, but I want to work with you for my international. It's harder and harder for the international banks to take just that piece of your business, they're going to want to look at the whole relationship. So for that reason, it it's very helpful and I would almost say important that you speak with your bank about how they can help you in this period of growth you're going to experience when you start to export. Or if you're already exporting and taking on new markets, how can your bank help you? So you want to look for international reach. And this doesn't mean that they have to have branches around the world, because listen, not everybody can be Citibank or HSBC, right? Uh, but do they have a correspondent bank network that they can work with? Um, that means they correspond with, or they have relationships with banks around the world, or that they work closely with a partner in the States, a bank partner, who in effect acts as their international department. Um, to the extent that they're committed to, that the bank is committed to international trade. You want to know that they have a trade sales staff and also operations because you're going to have questions. Um, international recognition, strong credit rating. This is really important because when you start talking, and, and this is as an exporter, what you want to know is, does, is your bank recognized by other banks? Do they have relationships? It kind of ties into the international reach point. But also, if you ever needed to issue a standby LC, for instance, uh, because you got an advance payment, and now you have to issue a standby LC to support that, uh, you want to know that your bank will be accept your bank's letter of credit will be accepted by your counterparty. Finally, the technology this can be helpful in terms of electronic platforms uh, for the for the services listed here. Um, it may or may not be critical. I would say that the, the international recognition and the reach are probably the most important. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention. And um, I think if there's any questions on this portion, if you, I think we, we said we could take a question or two, or are there any questions? Yeah, there was a question about how can you make sure that the letter of credit contract is going to go through and the exporter is going to get paid? Okay, that's a great question uh, because I've listed all of the risks for you. Uh, <laughs> and um, really the, the main thing, you need to make sure that you read that letter of credit through very carefully and make sure that you can comply if it says that you have to book a vessel or you have to ship by March 15th, just choosing a date, and you can't book a vessel for before by that date, and you can only get the goods out March 30th, you will have needed to talk with your, uh, your freight forwarder to understand what the availability of containers and that sort of thing is, because if you miss that March 15th shipment date and you present a document of it that includes a bill of lading that's dated March 15th or March 30th or March 16th, you will in effect be out of compliance with the letter of credit. So that's important to remember. So just really reviewing the letter of credit up front and making sure you can produce and ship as is outlined. So with that, Jenny, um, 
Which way am I going now? Who am I turning so over to? So we will be on to Abby and uh, Mercedes Great. is going to introduce her. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, thank you, Andrea, for such an informative presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Abby Martinez. She is the Export Finance Manager for the Small Business Administration's Office of International Trade, serving the New York and New Jersey markets. In this role, she will be responsible for business development and lender outreach efforts. Prior to this role, she was a regional director at the Export Import Bank of the United States. In addition, Abby has over 25 years of experience as a trade specialist in the banking industry, working at global, regional, and community banks. Throughout her career, she has specialized in traditional bank trade solutions as well as trade finance solutions. She has worked directly with government guarantee programs as well as insured receivables financing and supply chain financing to provide solutions for exporters on ways to grow their international business and maximize their working capital. In addition, Abby was previously appointed by the Department of State as a District Export Council member for South Florida for six years and served as a treasurer for four years, for two years. Abby is bilingual and earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Florida International University with a double major in international business and management. Please, Abby, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Mercedes. I hope everyone can see my uh, screen at this time. Um, but good morning, everyone. And Mercedes, thanks for that introduction and for the invitation to speak today at this event. Uh, my name is Abby Martinez, as you said, and I manage the New York and New Jersey market for the Office of International Trade here at the US uh, Small Business Administration. The mission of the Office of the International, of I'm sorry, the mission of the Office of International Trade is to increase the number of small business exporters that we support, thereby increasing the volume of U.S. exports. Like myself, we have export finance managers located throughout the states on both the East and West teams. And we are here to provide local training and to support lenders on the SBA export programs. And we're also here to provide training to small businesses and small business customers so they can access the working capital they need. So here are some of the challenges that exporters face when trying to obtain a loan. Uh, typically, banks are risk averse, as we know, and therefore they want to make sure that if they lend you money, that there is a reasonable assurance of repayment. So let's take a look at what some of these uh, credit tools are that banks look at. So definitely they look at the character. Um, what is your credit history? How have you performed in the past? Um, your capacity. Uh, what is your ability to repay that loan? Your capital. How much have you, as the exporter, invested in this business? They want to know that you have some skin in the game just as much as they're going to be risking a loan to you as well. Um, also, the collateral. They want to make sure that there's enough collateral to secure the loan in the event of anything going a little awry. And also the conditions. The conditions here, um, you know, it could be maybe the maturity, the purpose of the loan. They want to understand what these conditions are and they want to make sure that they match their lending policies. So what is the benefit of utilizing an SBA guarantee? Uh, basically, it serves as a credit enhancement to incentivize those banks to lend to small businesses such as yours. Um, those businesses that maybe do not meet some of their bank's credit requirements, right? Uh, typically, SBA does not lend directly to companies, um, but we do offer loan guarantees to banks. So what are some of the examples of credit enhancements? Basically, maybe uh, as far as character, maybe 
a bank is willing to accept the lower credit uh, credit score on, on the exporter. Uh, maybe they're looking at maybe a lower debt to service ratio. Uh, maybe the debt to equity ratio is going to be lower than what they're normally uh, using for their lending practices. Maybe there's insufficient collateral um, pledged for that loan. And so therefore they need the SBA in there to help guarantee the loan. And maybe the conditions could be a little bit more favorable utilizing SBA. Maybe instead of doing a 10 year loan, it could be a 15 year loan, which thereby improves the cash flow of your company so that the repayment is assured, right? The, that repayment assurance would be there. So once we have, you know, once we have all of this together, we have to take a look at um, what is the definition of exporting or what is an exporter to SBA. Um, in our standard operating procedures, our SOP, we list exporting as the production and payment associated with the sale of goods or services to a foreign buyer. So in order to qualify for these loans that I'm going to be talking about, you need to be exporting. And aside from being an exporter, the borrower must also satisfy all of the usual 7A requirements that SBA has under our loan programs. And those are primarily that you operate within the U.S., that you benefit your domestic operation, and that the business must be at least 51% owned by US citizens or legal permanent residents. So most recently, our SOP was updated to expand on the definition of exporting. And again, we know the definition of exporting, right? It's the export loan is the production and payment associated with the sale of goods or services. But now we have two different types of eligible in, uh, transactions included in that. So we have basically our domestic to foreign export, which is what we all know, right? You as a company are selling to a foreign buyer, those goods are being exported here from the US to that foreign buyer. However, in our most recent SOP, this definition also helped to clarify intangible transactions where no physical goods are being shipped. Because we always say, you know, these programs are good for if you're exporting goods and services. So now it allowed for that clarification to be included in the SOP. So if you do have a company that offers services, maybe digital services, licensing uh, transactions, things of that nature are now kind of more clarified in that definition. Another uh, Another aspect to this definition being broadened is the fact that um, we have our foreign to foreign exports. And this is a situation where an exporter sells to a foreign buyer, but the goods are not being sent from the US. So for instance, let's say the exporter makes their product in China and it's getting shipped directly to Spain. Well, the buyer in Spain is responsible for that repayment to the US exporter. This is what some people may call a drop shipment, but this was um, this change came about because this was especially crucial post COVID where supply chains were being affected and a lot of our exporters were being affected. Um, this allowed US companies to continue to manufacture, obtain their product from overseas, but send them directly to their foreign buyer without incurring any additional shipping charges of having to bring it back to the US and then reship it to that foreign buyer. So this has been a significant change to our policy and therefore it impacts our ability to assist exporters. It provides clarity when working with those service companies or digital exports where no goods are actually being shipped. Um, even tourism, right? That's also a, a product that could be uh, used as exports. Um, 
And on the foreign to foreign side, it increases the types of transactions that can be financed, right? Because it did alleviate that supply chain headache that exporters were facing when they had to ship only from the US. So there is another exporting term that is called our indirect exporting or indirect exporters, right? This is where a U.S. company has a customer located in the U.S. who they're supplying their products to, and that U.S. company will then uh, export their product. So you may have a domestic customer on your books, but actually that domestic customer may be selling their product internationally. So let's take, for example, and these are big examples, and there may be much smaller examples, but let's take, for example, Caterpillar or John Deere or Boeing. Um, these are all examples of domestic companies that may source materials from domestic suppliers um, that will go into a piece of machinery that is then destined for export. So if you are a supplier like that, you would be eligible for financing under our indirect exporter scenario. Now, I will say, though, there will be some documentation that you will need to um, obtain in order to qualify for this uh, type of financing, but it is an option. So the Office of International Trade, we want to make sure that you don't go it alone internationally. When you're going global, we want to make sure that you have the right resources, the right solutions um, to, to be able to hurdle any obstacle that comes your way. So the Office of International Trade actually mirrors what SBA as a whole provides. The only difference is, is we focus on global opportunities. So we do provide funding through our STEP grants. We provide export counseling and technical assistance, and we provide export or trade finance solutions. So as it relates to our grants uh, for established small businesses that are new to export um, or current exporters that are looking to maybe expand into new markets, the SBA Office of International Trade provides the state trade expansion program in participating states. Through these STEP grants, SBA provides financial awards that help non-federal partners assist small businesses with export development grants in order to get started with their global uh, outreach. Exporters can apply for these grants and they can be used to attend a multitude of, of, uh, of items. As you can see, you can attend a trade show, you can go to uh, trade missions, you can have website optimization for global sales, and many more. And I do know that um, Catherine mentioned early, earlier that even the XM credit insurance premiums and some of the commercial service uh, costs may be reimbursable under your state's uh, STEP program. Now, given that each state runs their grant programs differently, um, I do encourage you to reach out to get to know uh, the person that's in charge of STEP for New York State um, and to learn if the STEP could help move you forward in your export journey. So SBA is engaged in counseling and training, and mostly we do a lot of that through our district offices and our partner organizations. Um, as far as international trade, we uh, there's only 20 of us, 20 export finance managers like myself. Therefore, we partner with our district offices and our partner organizations listed here to provide those local counselors to help businesses get training, assistance, create plans so that you can start, grow, or expand your export business. Like the, like the um, organizations listed here, there are international counselors at each of these resources 
who can help you work on building your business, making sure that it is financially sound, making sure that you develop a strong export business plan so that you can tell a great story of your business um, and how it's been generating sales and what countries you're selling into and who's your customer base, as well as addressing any risks that you may have. Excuse me. We also, I'm sorry, hold on one second. We also have some partner loan programs that are available to exporters and non-exporters alike. So we do have, um, well, and I will say, once you have a plan um, under your belt, uh, financing will be key in helping your business grow, right? So we know that businesses that export have better bottom lines and are more resilient to financial downturns. Uh, sometimes the first hurdle of exporting um, or fulfilling an order is the upfront cost. So whether that's access to financing or the cost of participating in a trade show, SBA partners with specialized lenders to offer several loan guarantee pro products to obtain financing. And some of these products are listed here. Oh, sorry, there we go. Are listed here. Um, you can use SBA's microloans or micro lenders um, which can be used to help start your business credit. Um, some of them provide seed money. Some of them provide just uh, assistance in uh, providing marketing materials, et cetera. Um, but basically those microloans are for smaller size requests um, up to $50,000. Then we also have our Community Advantage Loan Program, which is really our uh, community, uh, our CDFIs, um, which provide uh, mission-oriented lenders, primarily they're nonprofit financial intermediaries that focus on economic development and they lend funds directly and they get their guarantee through SBA. And those uh, community advantage loan programs can go up to $350,000 or less. <clears throat> um, and then the last one there is our SBA 504 real estate loan program as well. Um, it does allow for a low down payment and for long-term fixed interest rates. Um, but whichever path you decide that works best for you, I would highly suggest you begin that lending relationship. Um, it's all about relationships. And this can help you in the long run to be prepared uh, so that you know what to expect when you need financing. And then SBA has some export loan programs that I'd like to talk about today. Um, and this is exclusively for companies that meet that ex SBA exporter definition. Um, and also that have been in business for at least one year. One thing I do want to highlight off of this slide is that bottom line. For fiscal year 24, 2024, no SBA fees are going to be collected on loans of less than a million dollars. So our Export Express. Um, this is basically a, de a delegated loan program, and it could be either a loan, a term loan, or a line of credit that is issued uh, supporting your export transactions up to $500,000, okay? It could be used to purchase real estate. It could be for equipment. It could be for debt refinance. It could be just to support your working capital needs. Um, it could be used to issue standby letters of credit if you need them. Um, you know, definitely this is uh, a very flexible product. And as you see there on the pros and cons, one of the pros is it is very flexible. It could be a term loan. It could be a line of credit. Um, there is a quick turnaround time. It is a very streamlined process. And again, since most of the loans are under the, under the million dollars, they are no SBA fees for fiscal year 2024. Um, the cons is 
there is a maximum of $500,000, right? So we do have another program that would kind of fit, you know, if, if you're in that higher bracket. Um, and I will say that our Export Express also has some additional documentation. Basically, we have an exporter questionnaire that we would need to have completed. And it basically is what would be in your international business plan. What countries do you sell to? What is your customer base? Um, what are you looking to do with this loan? What are your what is the purpose, right? Um, so basically, that would be what is uh, it's a con, but it's not really a con because you'd probably already have that done. Our international trade loan. Now, this is actually a term loan uh, where the loan proceeds can be used to expand your existing export markets or to help you develop new markets. It actually can even help you to uh, let's say buy a piece of equipment because you're looking to expand or you see that your export sales are growing and you need to have more capacity. So you need to purchase um, a piece of equipment that'll help you with that uh, capacity issue, right? So definitely this is something that you can take a look at. We can support debt refinance, business acquisitions. It could be permanent working capital. You can acquire real estate or equipment, um, but basically any of that would be uh, a, per a good purpose for this type of loan. Under this type of transaction, there is a maximum loan amount of $5 million, and the bank guarantee is 90%. And I guess I, I failed to mention that on the other one as well. Um, there is up to a 90% guarantee on the Export Express. Um, and I think for thirty uh, for 350 and higher, it's only 75 but it can be up to 90%. Um, some of the pros of the international trade loan is that we have longer terms, longer maturities for these types of transactions. Uh, startups are possible, especially if you're buying a company. Um, you know, we would take a look at that. Um, it also enhances the ability to access the financing because it does provide a wide range of, of use of proceeds. Um, and there is a $5 million maximum, which is pretty decent compared to what you would normally think of for equipment and stuff. Um, the cons, um, an export business plan is required. And this one's a little bit more in depth than the questionnaire or the smaller for the Export Express. This one has to have like 12 month projections of what you're planning to do with your business. It does have to have that in there. <clears throat> um, there will be SBA fees for any amounts uh, for international trade loans over a million dollars. Um, and there is a higher guarantee uh, it's a higher guarantee for you, for the bank. Therefore, there will be higher guarantee fees that are due to SBA. So for the guarantee fees for this loan are 90%, whereas maybe a typical SBA 7A may be 50%, right? So you have to take that into consideration as well. And then our export working capital program. And this is our working capital line of credit. Um, it's used to fulfill export orders. This is really for our more experienced uh, exporter. It support loans up to $5 million. It is a revolving line of credit and it could be uh, structured in two different ways. It could be either a transaction based, meaning that you have a specific transaction that you need this working capital program for, or it could be asset based, meaning that you have consistent export sales that typically your bank excludes from financing. So therefore this incentivizes them to include them into a borrowing base. Um, typically those assets that are included in that borrowing base are your foreign receivables and any export related inventory. Um, as you see there, there are different advance rates for that. Also, this line of credit could be utilized to issue standby letters of credit with just a 25% cash collateral. Most banks require 100% cash collateral, but in this case, standby letters of credit are uh, available with 25% cash collateral or 25% or with um, the borrowing base capacity. So if you have a borrowing base that supports at least the 25%, that would be doable as well. Um, and in this case also, the collateral is limited just to your export related assets. Um, 
Some of the pros, um, we have no US content requirement, military sales are eligible, um, and this leaves your domestic receivables or your domestic side of the business available or eligible for conventional financing. Some of the cons, again, you may have fees if you go over that million dollar uh, threshold, right? But it's it, it'll be worth it though, um, and there is um, for the asset based lending there is an ongoing uh, reporting by the exporter every month you would have to submit a borrowing base to your lender saying what uh, transactions you have outstanding what is your position at this time with uh, with your uh, assets. So again, at SBA, we want to make sure you know you don't have to go it alone internationally. SBA has many solutions uh, for any obstacles that may come your way. Um, and we want you to be competitive overseas and feel that with the use of our programs and our partners programs, you will be successful. So I want to thank you for your time. My contact information is on this slide. And if you have any questions um, or would like to discuss further, uh, again, thank you. And I will, I will turn it back over to Mercedes. Thank you, Abby, for that great presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our last but not least speaker of the day. As a regional director at Exim, Richard Foy has responsibilities for outreach and education from New York to Maine. He works with exporters, lenders, and industry leaders to ensure that the bank's programs are understood and utilized. Prior to joining the bank, Richard was with International Finance Group, where as BDP, as VP of commercial lending, he provided access to loans by working with various funding sources to meet the needs of his clients. Prior to this, Mr. Foy was underwriting ocean marine cargo insurance and has an extensive logistic background with over 20 years in field holding positions in operations, risk management, quality assurance, and environmental affairs. Please, Richard, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had some great presenters uh, so far, excellent uh, presentations. I think Catherine's uh, winning the day because she has uh, grant money available. But you know, we'll try to uh, satisfy some of some of your needs uh, here here as well. Um, first, we'll go through. Let me just see if I can share. Exim Bank. Um, so I'm the regional director, as uh, was said, for the Northeast uh, region. Exim Bank operates out of 12 regional offices. We were established in 1934 as part of a new deal to help facilitate jobs uh, focusing on exports. Uh, companies that export grow at a faster rate and they hire, uh, they hire more people and they're more sustainable than uh, those that don't. So this is why we focus on exports. And I'll explain what we do to make sure that we are actually uh, focusing on, on exports later on. Uh, I'll go quickly high level through what the kind of needs and solutions here. If you need funds to fulfill orders, a working capital, a capital uh, loan guarantee program uh, may be a good fit uh, for you. When you extend credit to your foreign buyers, uh, export receivable insurance is likely going to be an excellent tool uh, for you. And if you're selling capital equipment to foreign buyers, you may be asked to facilitate uh, loans for them, our medium long-term insurance and loan guarantees might be a good fit in those cases. I want you to know that Exim Bank, we are small business focused. Uh, the vast majority of our transactions are in fact for small business, even though we do support Boeing, uh, GE, well, maybe to a lesser degree now, but um, you, you Boeing, GE, all these big companies, big projects, absolutely, uh, we support them with loans to foreign buyers so that they can buy this uh, US equipment. I think that's a good thing uh, because those fees help us provide all of these great programs to small businesses. So this is some uh, statistics of what we've done. This is 2022. We don't have the, the new ones yet, but um, yeah, 88% small business. That's always a good story. And what we, uh, what we do is we try to level the playing field so that U.S. exporters can compete globally. Um, 
I think the overarching theme is minimizing risk, all right? Uh, minimizing, minimizing the financial risks associated with um, exporting. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further as uh, we go on. We don't compete with private markets, private banks, private insurance uh, carriers. We look to uh, supplement, okay? Fill gaps, if, if you will. And um, I'll say no company or transaction is too small, but there's a caveat. And again, I'll, I'll go into that a bit. So the question is, why do so few companies export? Only 1% of companies uh, export. And the common thing is they, they, they fear the unknown. The risk associated with exporting is terrifying and crippling to a lot of companies. So they don't get started. And you've seen through these uh, through this webinar, the the resources you have at your uh, your disposal are vast. These are not even all of them. It's important to understand everybody on this uh, this panel today has your best interest as an exporter in mind. We communicate regularly. We all are open to listening to your story and trying to plug you into an appropriate resource. So I think all of these presentations and our contact information is going to be uh, shared. If you have any questions, just reach out to any of us. If it's not a fit for us, doesn't match, we're gonna plug you into the appropriate resource. So at XM, our programs uh, and, and products really cover the spectrum from pre-export financing to post-export financing, as you can uh, see here. So we're looking to trim some of the risks associated through the entire supply chain. I'll start with the working capital loan guarantee. And Abby went through this um, you know, already. Our working capital guarantees are very similar. It's it's a guarantee to a commercial lender. So we're protecting their risk against non-payment from you as the borrower. Okay, that's important to understand. It helps you in an indirect fashion because it can unlock some uh, potential funding uh, for you where maybe conventionally you wouldn't be able to without uh, this, all right? Um, so you can often borrow more with the same collateral, uh, secure performance and bid bonds when projects and in, in, increase your uh, competitiveness. So again, it's a 90% guarantee. Our, our uh, program is 90% guarantee of repayment. It's principal and interest um, to the lender. So the lenders love it, right? Um, this is a loan that they can make to, to you and they have 10% risk. In, in the transaction. So it really incentivizes them to support exporters. That's the goal, okay? Um, it can be set up as a transaction-specific a transaction specific or a revolving line of credit, depending on your needs um, at the moment. If you're a regular exporter and you have constant deal flow, it's probably a good idea to set it up as a revolver. We don't have a minimum or maximum amount. And this is where I'll explain that's not really true. We don't as XM Bank, but we're not making the loans in this capital working capital program the lenders are. So they'll have to choose which guarantee program meets their needs. More often than not, if you have a loan, say under $2 million, they're going to choose an SBA um, a guarantee so long as it meets all the qualifying elements, okay? Um, if it goes, starts going over or if they feel as though the growth of the company is going to move beyond SBA's capacity of $5 million, well, then they'll start off with, uh, with an XM. We have plenty of companies that start with uh, an SBA guarantee, and then they graduate into uh, an XM as they grow. And we've had few that have gone the other way. They, they just don't need uh, everything involved with an XM uh, program, and then they go uh, SBA. And that's fine. You work with your lender, whatever works for them, it fits your needs, that's where you're going to go. Uh, but it's, it's important to know that when you're going down this path, you say, man, that guy, Rich, he, uh, I'm totally on board with XM. You go to your bank and they and they say SBA is better for you. It's not a bait and switch thing. It's just what's best for them. So um, it's asset base, fully collateralized. Uh, you do need a, a personal guarantee of owners 20% or more. The delegated lender fees, so it's uh, the, the guarantee fee for those that have delegated authority and, and Andrea, uh, mentioned that earlier, they range depending on the loan amount. It'll range from you know a, a quarter point to uh, point nine. 
and the interest rate that's negotiated between you and the lender directly. So the benefits, of course, so that you can unlock your uh, cash flow. I'm going to go you protect against risk. We've uh, done this, but I'm going to go to, you're, you're going to work with your bank. The, the key here is that you start off with your, your bank. If your bank, and even if you come to me, I'm going to try to introduce you to your banking relationship to see if they can meet your need. All right. If they can't, then I'm going to try to plug you into another lender in our network that has the appetite for your, for your need. As Andrea said before, that may um, come to a decision point where you may have to change your banking uh, relationship. It's not always. We try to just do these loans individually and you can keep your other banking relationship, but sometimes lenders just need uh, more in order to make these loans available to you. So the, I like this um, this slide. I think it really highlights uh, the importance of, of having a guarantee uh, program. We'll look on the left-hand side. This is uh, your, your borrowing way base. You have basically a million dollars in export inventory. It's raw material, whip, and finished goods, right? And then you have um, accounts receivable, also a million dollars. Now, the advance rate on a, on a, a loan... A, I'll, I'll say a conventional loan, they usually advance about 20% on raw materials, nothing on work in progress, and about 50% on finished goods that you have in in, uh, in inventory. Um, zero on unprotected um, AR, and usually about 70% when there's an LC involved. So $2 million in, um, in, in export assets, you'll likely get a facility about 760,000. Now, with an XM guarantee, also SBA, very similar, you can see that we can push the advance rate on your export inventory up to 75%, and we can really increase the, um, the receivables as well. And I'll focus on this area here, which, I mean, that 360,000 is, is available to you just in that in this case. Um, so it's very important that we we look at a program that can support your foreign receivables, especially as they they grow. So you go from 760,000 all the way up to 1.6 million in available working capital. And that's a, you know big a big difference here. Um, Andrea had a similar slide here um that she went over and i thought it was a great slide hers is in the form of a ladder but i think you got the the basic gist of it that cash in advance is great for the seller right um but it's very high risk for the buyer and it can be it can negatively affect the sale because they are limited by how much cash they have on hand they're limited to the uh the the size order they can do now on the flip side of that open account, it's great for the buyer because they can buy the goods, receive the goods, sell the goods, and then pay you. But that's a high risk for the uh, for the seller. So how can we deal with this? Credit insurance is a great uh, a great solution. We so we've protected the bank in this scenario, right? We've given them ninety percent. So if if for some reason, your your business just goes south and you're unable to pay the bank back, they're getting paid back. So I'm sure you can sleep at night. All right. The problem is you're still on the hook. Remember the personal guarantee? You're still on the hook for, for that money. So I want to protect you now. All right. Let's right. We'll, we'll finish this uh, circle and we say, the likely reason that you're not going to be able to pay your loan back is if you don't get paid, Right. Um, so when you're extending terms to your foreign buyer, let's ensure those receivables so that the foreign buyer doesn't pay you, we're going to pay you. And then you can pay the bank. They'll be part of the transaction. Okay. This allows you to be competitive with open, open account terms, but you can also sleep at night. All right. You can also use those receivables that are insured to increase your borrowing base. So we'll go over these. So this is how it works, basically. When you identify a foreign buyer, all right, maybe you've worked with commercial service, they found you a great distributor in whatever country, and you say, all right, great, we, we're, we're going forward, they're going to start placing uh, good orders, and but they say, we need, we need open terms, we need to be able to bring the goods in and sell them before we, we, uh, we pay you. All right, that's great. 
you're, you're a little uncomfortable, but you know that you heard from me. So you know what you're going to do. You're going to contact Exxon Bank and we're going to put in a, a put a policy together for you. All right. We'll introduce you to a, a broker that specializes in export credit insurance. We'll put a policy in place. Now, when you ship to them, if they fail to pay you, now we're going to pay you and you're going to live to fight another day. So this is a great story. So what do we cover? We cover the commercial risks like insolvency, bankruptcy, and protracted default. So if they're not paying in accordance with the contract, political risks, which are, you know, underappreciated, but valuable, um, war, revolution, insurrection, and the way the world is going, this is increasingly important. Currency transfer risks. So when they can't get U.S. dollars out of the country to pay you, right, um, we cover Cancellation of an importer and export license, and this happens. You know, if you're if you're selling, say, beef to a an, you know a certain country, and they're fearful that it might be diseased, they'll shut down. You cannot import beef into this. You're already on the water. You know, you're you're um, in a bad position. We um, so we'll cover that. Disputes with the buyer are not covered. All right. So if they order white socks and you send them pink socks and they're arguing i'm not paying you for pink socks well you have to work that out beforehand okay so if you say all right look pay me 70 percent for the pink socks you negotiate that with us involved we reset the the invoice and then you're covered from that that agreement point forward okay but we should be involved in any negotiation so um, usually we cover up to 180 days we, we can uh, do. Exceptionally, we can, like, depending on the product, we can push it up to a year. The coverage to you is 95%. So this is good, right? You're borrowing, the bank's getting 90%. You're getting 95%. You're at 5% risk. So you're already beating the bank. All right. So you pay, you're able to pay the bank back um, and you you have your some of your profit left right um commercial and political risks later policies we have i'll go with through the different policy um types so multi-buyer policy we cover 95 percent. so this is uh we look at the entire export portfolio uh if you have 10 foreign buyers that you're selling to on open payment terms we look to cover all of those we'll set limits and and in terms for each of them, um, if you need an increase, you just come to us. Hey, they're buying more. They, I had a hundred thousand dollar limit for sixty days. Now they need a three hundred thousand dollar limit. We'll evaluate that, increase the limits uh, accordingly. Our Express program is a multi buyer program, um, but it's kind of like for those that are new to exporting on on open payment terms. We do the credit check uh, for you. So the, the premium is slightly uh, higher, but we handle all the back end um, for you. You give us a name, your relationship, uh, information with them, what you've sold uh, to them or anticipate selling. And then we just add them to, to the pot. Uh, and there's a limit of 10 on that particular buyer. And then we have other uh, companies that maybe they have a private sector policy because they export a lot, but the private policy can't offer terms or won't offer terms to a particular area or for a, a enough, um, you know, a, a amount uh, for, for a particular order. Well, we're fine with that select risk as well. You come to us and we'll put a single buyer policy in place uh, for those particular orders. Um, that's a 90% coverage because we do have a concentration of, of risk there, but that still offers um, excellent coverage for you. Same, same policy form. Credit information, what we what we look for here um, is pretty lean. Up to 100,000, we look for a trade reference. 100 to 500,000, we want a credit report and trade reference. 500,000 to a million, it can vary. Maybe we'll need bank references, but we'll need financial statements in, in addition, okay? We take all of our applications through specialist brokers. These are people that, only deal with trade credit insurance. Then I can sell you an auto policy or a home policy. These are trade credit brokers. 
And it's important to understand the value that they have to you. I could tell you all day what XM Bank can and cannot uh, do. And it might meet your needs. It might not. The especially brokers, they have the broader market view. So if XM can't meet your needs, they can say, well, I have this other carrier that that can meet your needs. And then they'll, they'll present those uh, options to you. So sometimes you'll work with XM Bank policy and then you'll graduate. Um, to another private sector uh, policy. And we're fine with that. You know, we want to see you grow. Again, our core mission is to grow jobs through export, not sell insurance policies. We Our focus is jo growing jobs. So if you're growing and exporting more, we're, we're happy. So single buyer policy, this is a, a case study where an exporter had 12 active policies with XM Bank. They, um, they had a private sector uh, policy, but these we needed to uh, supplement those, all right? The policies were ranging from, you know, 50 to six, uh, 600,000 um, per, per buyer. And the monthly average monthly cost was uh, about 840,000 to, um, to endure, it was uh, um, 84 basis points. So 840,000 to ensure 100,000 in monthly sales. So this allowed them to grow in areas that their private policy didn't really allow them to, all right? Um, they weren't limited by what their core policy allowed. They were able to supplement that coverage with, with us and it worked very well for them. Our medium term uh, financing is for when you have capital equipment that you wanna to sell to a foreign buyer and they need financing. Um, this happens more often than you may think because U.S. interest is uh, is still very attractive, our banking uh, rates still very attractive, so we can finance um, eighty five percent. We look for fifteen percent uh, equity in the deal, repayment up to five years on our medium term deal. Sometimes we can push it up to uh, seven years, and these are usually up to about twenty five million. Longer uh, or higher value deals tend to get longer term financing. Some restrictions that you should be aware of with XM Bank. We can't handle military or defense products. That's why Abby said that specifically in her her slide. It, it's an important um, it, it's an important exception, especially in this area. I, know I work with Connecticut, and they deal a lot with uh, military sales. Goods must sh ship from a U.S. port. There's another difference from SBA. SBA they're allowing foreign to foreign. And that's great if that's uh, what you do. We're looking for goods to originate here in the U.S. We want to make sure that they're being manufactured, 50% of greater U.S. content uh, here, that they're shipping to, uh, you know, from, from the U.S. as well. We're open in over 180 countries. We have a country limitation schedule on our website where you can select your country and see whether we're open, whether we're not, or whether there are some special circumstances you need to consider when you're you're shipping there. Oh, there we go. I didn't know I had this slide. Country limitation schedule, like I said. Um, the eligibility criteria, so 50% or greater US content, okay? That's your cost in, included, so overhead, um, but not your markup, okay? For our loan programs, we need three-year operating history and a positive net worth, not the same for our export credit. We look for a year in, in business. You need a DUNS number, and now you need this fun additional number, a unique entity identifier number where you can, you can get that from sam.gov. There are resources that can help you through that process of obtaining the, um, the, the UEI. We have some people in-house. I can also refer you to um, this APTAC uh, group that they handle procurement, and this is a procurement number for the U.S. government. So additional resources we uh, discussed, Department of Commerce, Carmel is going to be great for you when you're looking at new markets. You want to grow into uh, new markets, so you're going to you know, help identify a great market for you, a great partner for you. Then you're going to come to us or SBA for uh, loans and, uh, and and SBA for grants. Here's some resources uh, for you. I'm not going to go through them, but you can look. We're sharing these uh, these slides, so it's that's great. Some additional 
stuff xm always putting out new content very informative our blog is fantastic you can learn a lot from looking at our, our blog so i encourage you to do it and sign up for a newsletter as well these are our, where our regional offices um, are located i'm in new york and uh, this is my contact information i welcome anybody to call me email me uh, schedule a, consulta a consultation so we can discuss your specific needs and challenges and see how we can um, help um, help you with them. And I'll turn it back over. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Richard, so much for this highly educational presentation. And now we're gonna open the floor for any questions that attendees may have. I know that we've been answering some of the chat questions that were placed, but if anyone has additional questions, we are welcome to now, please. Yes, please make use of that Q&A box. Uh, we have the all-star export New York team together today, <laughs> all one place together for you right now. So it's a great time to ask any questions that you have about export and trade finance. Uh, we'll give people a few minutes to uh, get some questions in. And while we do that, I do just want to say thank you to everyone and uh, express that we are grateful for these questions because we've been getting some good ones in the Q&A box in the chat. And uh, just do remember that I know it's been so much information today. We will give you slides and a recording so you can go back over everything that you need. Um, if you do leave us uh, early before the Q&A is finished, we do have a, a brief uh, follow-up evaluation for the webinar. We love getting your feedback and hearing what other topics you would like to learn about. All right, so we have some questions in the chat. Mercedes? Um, this question is from a person that we've been answering through the chat that is asking about how a consumer can hold a license. This is unrelated to the topic for the in the webinar. So this will be a one-to-one -one consultation uh, that we will address through the SBDC. Any other questions, please? While we're waiting oh. for uh, for a question, I just want to say one thing that, that always uh, comes up, I think is important to uh, convey. Andrea touched on it uh, regarding um, your, your banking relationship um, and, and kind of interviewing your bank, knowing what they um, their, their capabilities are. I think it's important to understand, we deal with a lot, I'm in the office of small business. It's important to develop that relationship with a bank that can support you where you are now and where you're going and i see it all the time where we have um, a banking mismatch you know and i'm not going to name names of big of banks but you know where you have a small company um banking with the largest of banks and when it comes time for a financing need the bank doesn't have much interest in dealing with these um, smaller businesses so when you're starting you want to understand their capacity but you also want to stand, understand their interest in supporting small business businesses of your size so these early kind of interview um you know uh, questions i think is very important when you're trying to choose a bank or when when you're thinking about changing uh, banks Thank you, Richard. Question in the chat uh, regarding a very brand new exporter and where to start with the financial resources. So if we could have our experts chime in here. Uh, I think the first thing is to contact the local SBDC and find out, so we can find out more where the exporting activity is, uh, they could also, of course, contact our colleagues uh, from the U.S. Department of Commerce. And I am not sure that Global New York would like to entertain this type of question because they do different things. But in any case, we need to understand a little bit more of the transaction in order to give any sort of advisement. Um, and of course, their own bank will be the first place, but um, I will advise you to contact the local SBDC or Carmela. Mercedes, I'd love to have you elaborate a little bit more on that because I know you've talked with me about why it's so important 
to get advisement and and some expert advice up front, um, just due to the the specifics that are involved in international trade. And so please uh, expound a little bit more on that because I think sometimes people who are brand new looking at this don't always understand everything that's involved. Um, we talk prior uh, in conversations how informational and how knowledge dense is the activity of exporting. So before trying to do anything, people should truly get the information and then take a sound decision, make a sound decision about this. Um, regarding financial resources, I mean, this question is so broad because we don't know what the financial requests are for, if it's for manufacturing, if it's um, for buying and outsourcing, you know, or, or what is going on with them. Every business is different, very different. Every, every case that I find and when I am counseling is a world in itself. So that is why we advise people. It's very difficult to generalize. Um, that's why this one-to-one -one consulting is so important just to figure out how to help this person and what can we do to help them further develop their export activity. Yeah, and I agree that the Small Business Development Center is a great resource for those that are, are just starting because they get you started in the right way. Um, you have one or maybe one, one thing in mind. Um, meanwhile, there are a whole other you know, host of things that you need to consider before you begin engaging in, in business and more specifically in exporting. And they help identify those, give you some homework to do to get you up to speed. Um, and then we can focus on very specific needs. And then they'll plug you into maybe one of uh, one of us. Uh, if it's a matter of engaging in a market, maybe you'll uh, get pushed over to um, Department of Commerce or a loan or whatever else. Um, they're, they know all of the resources available and they'll know the best ones available for you. Yeah, like, need... um, mm -hmm. yeah, I was gonna just, you know, support what Rich was saying. And it's really important for those new to exporting, as I mentioned way at the beginning of this webinar, to do your homework. There's lots of different tools. I think it's important if you're looking for financial reasons, resources, the Commerce Department doesn't get engaged with that. But um, we have lots of market research and we could help provide information um, to help you develop your, your international marketing plan so that you could demonstrate to the bank that you've done your homework, you've targeted these countries. So I think it's important for a new exporter to be strategic in which countries are going to be exporting to and just not reactive, you know, you know, so it's important to be very strategic that way your limited resources could be maximized. So, so yeah. yeah, just, you know, just doing your international marketing plan. Obviously, your business plan is the priority initially and SBDC could be very helpful with that. Exactly. SBDC, the counselors at the SBDC are very acquainted and very used to assisting companies um, in the drafting of the business plan and also creating the financials. There, there's going to be a bank involved or any financial entity um, that they can prepare the documentation that is required. So that's what we advise to visit the local SBDC and get a one-to-one -one counseling session first. Thank you, Carmela Clarifying and that. Richard. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, Catherine just shared a great uh, online resource in the chat. And we do have some other things that have been shared in the chat as far as how to contact your local SBDC if you're interested in working through some of these details to prepare for export or to grow uh, existing export operations. And uh, so let's see, we do have a question. Oh, there is a person that said that how it will be able to stand on the area of exporting services or who should I contact? I live in New York City. Um, the link provided by Jenny, it will identify the local SBDC center 
and I will start there. Identify the local SBDC center and then request a counseling session. And after you get in touch with one of the counselors, they will contact me as well. So we will go from there. And Jenny is sharing again that link, but that is how to start in the process. Yes. Yeah, we have 20 centers around the state, so you can go in and choose which one is closest to you and get that process started if you are interested in that assistance. And again, we just want to remind you, we are your tax dollars at work. So we are a government-funded program, and therefore we are able to offer our services at no cost to you. And so that's we're great and we're free. <laughs> and, we're we're and one also, of those crazy things that is great and free. <laughs> so please make use of us. Uh, we we would love to to help you out. We also are prepaid. very well prepaid. Not we, prepaid. We partner with way. all of these people that we are showcasing here. So we work closely. We make referrals. We talk about cases. You know everything that you need. It will be, you know, for market expansion. Again, I mean the Department of Commerce has amazing. Uh, capabilities for market research as well. And their website has a wealth of information for educational materials. And then Global New York has also funding and also they have the consultants that can help with market development as well. So as I said, if we understand every case individual, individual, individualized, then we are able to refer to whatever is necessary in the network. Yeah, that's very true. And I, I wasn't, I only had like three to five minutes, um, but I just wanted to mention like Global New York in our offices where we're in 80 countries, we, our sweet spot um, is helping match make U.S. companies with the right distributors, agents, importers, customers. That's our sweet spot. We do work really close with New York State. And New York State companies will will clearly use New York State services in the in the countries that they have offices. But our sweet spot is vetting, helping U.S. companies who are expert ready to vet international buyers. Because if you don't have any international buyers, you really don't need any financing. <laughs> so, but getting your true. financing in, is really important in place ahead of time. Yes. yes. And, and 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 Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I was just going to add to that, um, just to uh, provide some additional information. Um, you know, at SBA, we have some of our micro lenders, which help with seed money. They provide for different underserved communities. And I'll add the link in the chat so that everybody has it. Um, but definitely also looking out or reaching out to those micro lenders in your area that they can help you also with that starting point. Some of them, if you are doing exports, though, they will want you to talk to the SBDC and have that export business plan ready, but they are a great resource as well and can help you with financing. And I just wanted to add uh, to Carmela, this is the first program that is featuring all the partners together as an introduction, because the main topic was trade finance, and we are planning to have a larger program featuring the three service providers in which we assist companies to understand how they can obtain the information through research and also what is the type of information that they need for exporting and understand better what each of the agencies does. And that is the reason why, I mean, this one was just specific on trade finance, you know? Uh, we are going to have every month we have educational webinars so please look out for this and um, pay attention to the emails that are sent through the sbdc network to let you know about our educational export webinars yes and i did drop a link for the step program webinar which you have heard about today um, run by global new york and uh, that will be coming up in two weeks. It will be on February 7th at 10 a.m. There is a link for registration in the chat, and I can drop it there again, uh, just so it'll show up right away for you. But we would love to have you join us for that overview uh, of the program so you can learn more about the specifics uh, 
since it was just kind of mentioned today. More information to come just on that program uh, in the next webinar that uh, Mercedes has planned. Okay, let's see. Oh, and Catherine, go ahead and say that out loud. We'd love to have you <laughs> chime in on that. <laughs> Um, we also have uh, the registrations not up yet, but we are also going to be having a um, webinar on website localization for global markets, which would be about how to design your content and pages um, within your website to be attractive and to maximize, maximize your search engine optimization. Um, that is also something that is eligible in the STEP grant for partial reimbursements. So um, lots of opportunities to keep learning and growing. And, and that's really what we're all about. And we will make sure that we provide also information on that webinar through our SBDC network and participate there as one of the service providers. Yes, Very and good. a great way to stay up to date on our uh, happenings and partnerships with other organizations is to be subscribed to our email newsletter and uh, it goes out monthly and then we also send out specific trade related uh, uh, emails as well so if you are not on our list yet today we would love to have you join there so that we can keep you informed on the things that will be coming up and it will show up in your inbox and you won't have to search for it so straight to you so I am noticing that we've all come in in a theme today, which I thought was kind of nice. We have this nice spectrum of of cool cool blues. <laughs> I know, so informative and color coordinated. Coordinated. I mean, you could not ask for more from this this uh, trade finance dream team. So, all right. Well, I think that takes care of all of our questions today. So we will wrap up. Remember, as I mentioned previously, you will be getting links in the follow up email. And uh, thank you to Richard, Mercedes, Catherine, Carmela, Abby, and Andrea, who had to uh, pop off early to, to get to a meeting uh, that sh uh, she had to be at. Please give us some feedback in that evaluation, the uh, webinar evaluation, if you have a few moments, and look for the follow-up email coming in your inbox. We appreciate you all and wish you a lovely rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.